Good afternoon. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to welcome you to the next session of our symposium on ancient Greece. And um, it's always a pleasure to have our emeritus faculty with us and uh, colleagues of our uh, fine supporter and uh, one of the columns, you know, I think you're seeing columns and things here. One of the columns of Eastern Illinois University is with us uh, as we uh, watch this. I will be thinking of that. I don't care what you say. I will be saying here is part of the structure of, uh, of our institution for uh, such a long time. And um, I will ask Dr. Wafik Wabi to make the introduction. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to uh, one of the most interesting presentations of our symposium. The symposium is a futuristic look through ancient lenses. And you see the picture chosen by our speaker here, futuristic look through ancient lenses. That tells you something. I mean, I need not to introduce him to after this, but uh, you are for a treat today, and uh, how would you introduce a geologist, geographist, a scientist, a thinker, a friend? I mean, it's very difficult. So I think about the chair of medicine, and she's coming with us. <laughs> What can I say about my father-in-law here? He's the reason I'm here at Eastern. Bragged about my grandchildren. And <laughs> yes, he's got four grandchildren, two Christian and me not so much. So, uh, so I'm pleased to be here. Uh, you're going to hear an excellent talk on geology and geography uh, in relationship to, to ancient Greece. So Alan uh, was chair of the department for 25 years, wealth of knowledge. You can expect any of that from him today. So uh, if you would uh, join me in welcoming Alan. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Mike. And thanks, Alan. I remember all the years there were many Alans in the campus. <laughs> we want to talk about Alan. We always said, good Alan. That was prefaced. This thank Dean and thank you, friend, Dr. Wafik, for organizing such a magnificent right, presentation to our campus. It is a stopiness, a step in the stones that we brought us to this point, this civilization. So as you see it, the picture shows we to look at the past, from past to the future. They were, the Greeks were the stepping stone that started our civilization to where we are. They said the pattern, the concept. And the topic is, the geology and geography of Greece and foundation of the Greece culture, concept, what they passed on to us, greatly affected by They didn't have electricity, car, tractors, none of those things, fertilizer. So everything, the food, their supplies, their energy, depends whatever nature could provide and sustain it. This, this is the time. So, so they had to adjust, improvise, and use natural resources to sustain themselves, exclusively nature. <coughs> and you see some of the features. Greek is a unique land form. These ancient civilizations, they made the greatest contribution, and this is fantastic for Dr. Wafik and Dean Allen to have this concept to take us back through time. Each of us here are benefiting at this moment or followed, following those concepts that they set, they patterned. This time we focus on Greeks. We have done it only Egyptian. Greeks made one of the mo most contribution to who we are now, how do we think, what we believe, than these f five civilizations. You all familiar? 
These were the five civilizations, Egyptians, Romans, Persians, Greece, and Mesopotamia on radius of Mediterranean Sea, here southern part of Europe. This is the focus of these ancient civilizations. Greece, a country in southeastern Europe whose peninsula extends from the Balkans in the Mediterranean Sea in mountains with many gulfs and bays. Forests fill some areas of Greece. Much of Greece is stony. That means really don't have soil for agriculture. It's rock. And suitable only for pastures, but few other areas are suitable for growing wheat, barley, citrus, dates, and olives, which Greeks are famous. And this is the country. Pretty soon you will see it's a unique landform. And that unique landform posed a great deal of challenges to the people who live there. The Greek called the land Hellas and themselves Hellens. It was the Romans who called them Greeks, Gracia, and that is the name by which we know them. The Greek historian Herodotus wrote that Egypt is the gift of Nile, but he never came up with an expression so memorable to describe his own country, because his own country perhaps because Greece was divided to many units, as you see, because of its landform, because of its mountains and rivers. So geography started having a great impact. Rather, it was a collection of city-state, although town, state, or even village state would have been more accurate, for few had the population to be called a city. Separated by their topography, the landform, the valleys, the hills, the mountains, the rivers. These city states were like a large family of quarrelsome brothers, almost always fighting with each other, but occasionally banding together to battle against outsiders when they felt like doing so. Afterwards, they were as likely as not to turn on each other again. The Greeks have often been described as independent-minded, and there seems no doubt that geology and geography played a major role in shaping that character. It was natural forces, mountains and sea, that molded Greece and Greeks in what they were. Most of the Greeks, of course, as said, Mediterranean. Most of the cities, Athens, a major city, are bounded by the ocean, Mediterranean Sea. <clears throat> so always at the edge of that critical point, land meets this ocean, and affected by the force of both the sea, the ocean, and the land. Greek was a shallow long before oxygen reached sea during Mesozoic. We divide the geologic time to Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic. Sen Mesozoic is the middle time. And that time, there was this, where the Greece is now, was a shallow sea covered. And shallow sea, all the sediments that came from the surrounding deposited there on where in that shallow sea, the continuous submerging allowed the formation of a huge layers of limestone. And you see these are the, all the factors affect Greece in the whole area. Then during the Cretaceous, middle of the Mesozoic, a big island appeared, which run off north to the south in the area between Thalassiniki and Athens. Here, the layers were partly eroded and today we find the many crystalline rocks, kind of original earth rocks, because these sediments on the top limestone have been eroded away, exposed original crystalline rock. 
and also most valuable resources of Greece, like coal, manganese, or iron, and silver ores. Earthquakes. Greece is one of the world's most seismically active region because all the forces that affect to build and is still there, surrounded by Alps, two continents coming together. Fortunately, most Greek earthquakes are relatively mild. Again, I want to synthesize these very extensive, powerful natural forces. And now how this civilization going to interpret the cause, the origin, the factors guiding, affecting, generating these forces. Fortunately, most Greek earthquakes are relatively mild, but there is always the potential for more severe seismic activity. Greek builders are aware of this, and modern Greek buildings are built to be safe during the earthquakes. With the Alpine orogeny, a mountain building forces to their west, Alpine, huge mountain, you know, orogeny formation, the limestone was lifted, these are these forces all over the country and folded. So today, about two-thirds of the area of Greece is covered with limestone. Caves are very common, as many other karst topography. Now, this creates a lot of majestic features for this ancient people to see, to define how it originated. Of course, this is the, all you familiar with Matterhorn. 14,000 is a peak of Alpine mountain to their west. These were the forces not only left these mountains, but later forces like glaciers erode them, carve them out. So tremendous amount of geologic forces that area. Most of the Crete, Greece, and Greek islands are contained in a box of fault lines. Fault lines are areas of the earth that move against each other horizontally or vertically. These movements create the earthquakes that Greece has so much. Run in different direction. This is in addition to the earthquake potential from the still lively volcanoes, including the Mircius volcano, though by some expert to be overdue for a major eruption. Next door, they have Italy with significant amount of volcano, Mount Etna. So, undersea earthquakes. Many of the quakes that strike Greece have their epicenter, where they energy released under the sea. While this can shake up surrounding islands, they rarely cause severe damage. The ancient Greeks attributed earthquakes to the god of sea. Here we go, how this movement takes place. They didn't have the geology knowledge in that time. They didn't have seismic record to measure movement. So they said there must be a, a god responsible. So this is the beginning of this concept that Greeks to finding the cause and effects of these forces. This was Poseidon. Perhaps because men, excuse me, I should have turned it off. Sorry. Okay. Undersea earthquakes. So there was a force responsible. Again, didn't have epi didn't have to measure these forces, a wave that creates and generates. So there was a God responsible for it. Perhaps because of many of them were centered under the waters. The Athens earthquake of 1999. One severe earthquake was the Athens earthquake of 1999, which stuck just outside of Athens itself. The suburbs where it stuck were among Athens' poorest with many old buildings. Over a hundred buildings collapsed. More than hundred people were killed and many others were injured or left homeless. So what this ancient civilization, when they see these powerful forces and the side effect, how they interpret it? 
there was a God responsible for it. And these rocks again, you see the amount of force that folded all these rocks, which is said many of the mountains of the Greece is a very popular place to go for field trip. And most of these rocks are made of limestone. And limestone, when water goes through it, dissolves, like alabaster cavern or mammoth cave and so on like that, hollows it inside and gives us the caves. And the caves, as the water dissolves limestone, trickle from the top, slowly deposit these and make this stalactite and stalagmite, which are coming from ceiling and from the floor. So some beautiful, majestic where caves form in this limestone. Again, these ancient civilization seeing this thing. Some, some of these coppers came down and colored these coppers. So they're very impressive forces shaping the land where the people can see. But how to improve? So, it is a very dynamic area of the world. The whole Mediterranean area, area is an active converging plate rim. I showed the picture where the African and European plates collide. Still, most of the action have, it means two plates coming together. Earth size, called plate tectonics. Imagine the forces of ongoing volcanism. In Greece, there is little volcanism, but sometimes heavy earthquakes and now and then some thermal springs that break the water which is in great depth, finally, through this rock movement, find a crack and come to the surface. Since it's in great depth, they're warm, as you get near the center of the earth, so you had hot speed. Every possible geologic, geographic forces appear in this, this area. This is what means the two plates coming together, moving each other. This is Tethys Sea, which is Mediterranean Sea. And as you see the movement of these plates, it creates some of the mountains of the Greece. Tethys Sea start dividing Pangaea, which is a one-piece land, call it Pangaea, into two sub supercontinents, Eurasia and Guana. That was once the Tethys Sea has become the Mediterranean Sea. Tethys Sea is named after Greek sea goddess Tethys. Again, you see these forces can that time have to assign in that force, a force beyond which is god or goddess. We can similar geographic evidence in Alpine orogeny, where the Alpine mountain form of Europe where the movement of African plate uh, raised the Alps like this. One of the most striking events in Mesozoic era was the rise of and dominance of dinosaurs, which is what this area very dominant. And of course, this later on, the Greeks find some of the fossil of these giant animals. Where were they? How did they get there? Where are they now? One of, the, uh, one of the most striking was the dinosaur. The Mesozoic is about 245 to 65 million years ago and is divided into three periods you hear Mesozoic. The rise of dominance of dinosaurs is one of the features of this area as far as. So this is the Greece. A shredded, a shredded landform with mountains and valleys, and several, 270 islands, so-called, because of all these forces, a rough land. Again, this show is all mountains and valleys and many, many separated pieces from each other. Athens is located someplace here. A unique landform, 
shaped by natural forces still active and been active. And here now the people within these forces. As you see, this is it. A very rough topography. Greece encompasses 50,000 square miles. The train is 80% mountainous with its highest point at Mount Olympus. Only 25% of the land surface is arable and another 40% serve as pasture. There are more than 2,000 islands, shredded, broken lands, 170 of which are inhabited and along, along a coastline. Again, all along, the forces of the ocean and the forces of land in contact, that's where these people are living. As I said, when is, this is one of the features. You seldom see any pasture, any soil for, so olive tree, which is famous. So all Greeks are famous with all olive diets or recipes and few trees that make the wine. So this is the way the land mostly looks like. With this 7,000 high, 9,000 height, Mount Olympus is Greece's highest mountain. Not only they are mountain, they are really majestic mountain. And between them, the valleys. They're not very powerful rivers. Have water part of the year you will see later on. And many of these mountains, because of their majesty, attracted the Greeks to build monument, build temple to, you see, the gods and goddesses, the powerful forces to guide them. Mountains in Greece do not soar to the height of other mountain ranges, such as Andes, Rockies, also Alps or Himalayas, but they are extensive. In fact, about 80% of Greece covered with mountains, with the rest at most settlements for less than 10 miles from a mountain. Every community, ten, these mountain ranges, isolated regions from each other. That's as when they said there were cities and they separated the land. They could not, con they didn't have cars or trains or planes and bicycle even to travel. So they were isolated, remain isolated. They were having horse and donkey, donkeys. These mountain ranges, isolated regions from each other more effectively than fences because that they lack in height, they make up its steepness and ruggedness, preventing or discouraging overland travel and communications. That's when they said at the beginning, they were isolated cities or tribes. No matter where people settled in Greece, they were rarely more than 50 miles from the sea. Hurricane, tides, those forces of the ocean, they always were facing, didn't know when would they come. They didn't have meteorology to forecast that when is they coming. They were just coming, appear. And so the, uh, the philosopher Plato noted that the Greeks live around the sea like frogs around the pond. A deeply indented coastline, as you see it, saw it before, held between its rock, rocky fingers, a sea that could vary from tranquil to turbulent, depending on the season and the weather. Again, they never know when and how and why. So I'll just put it a time. The Greek mariners had experienced firsthand the sea's treacherous currents and diabolical whirlpools. Mediterranean Sea has little plankton. That is why its waters are so clear. Doesn't have all the algaes and so on like that. It, it means that it doesn't support the extent and variety of sea life seen elsewhere like around Gulf of Mexico, but certainly enough to be both an important and welcome source of food. Surrounded by water, the Greeks nevertheless faced a shortage of fresh water. 
compared to many countries, there is a real scarcity of rivers, and these often dry up to a trickle in the hot summer months. Mediterranean climate, less clouds, summer hot, these rivers go dry. Summer temperatures, because of the cloud sky, often hotter than in the tropics. The lack of rivers offsets somewhat by a plentiful supply of fresh water springs, which those the snow and thing in the mountain go under the ground and finally comes out stream. These were precious and life-giving, and it is not surprising that they were considered to be sacred sites managed again by a god, Poseidon, which is god of the water, god of the ocean. They don't know what is happening, what is coming in, so they give it a magic. Athens, for example, as you see it located here, a site of Athens has been inhabited for approximately 8,000 years, ancient civilization. And from at least the beginning of Macedonian times, around 600 BC, it has been one of the greatest sites of Greece. Athens pressed, possessed cyclopean made of big rocks, since it mountain rocks, walls, monumental, in, monumental entrance, a postern gate, a real palace, and a secret water supply. All these made of rocks, huge rocks which is available to them. Like Egyptians used their, this limestone to make pyramids, the Greeks used limestone is easier to break and shape than granite and so on. So they had rock supplies. Athenian pottery, a lot of say, clays. There, so there were a lot of clay here. So Athenian pottery was the best in Greece and was widely exported for some 700 years. Again, use this clay material that shaped the pot. Another source of wealth was their silver from the mines of Laverian, especially from about 500 BC. Athens Basin contains a number of different neogen sedimentary rocks originally formed in shallow lakes such as limestone, mars, and I said clay. Clay deposits were abundant, so Greeks become famous in their pottery. For the basis of, again, nature forces, natural mass supplies determine the build, the character of this kind, even their art. For the basis of the ancient Athenian pottery industry and are still exploited today. How about Greek's weather? Greece has a Mediterranean climate with plenty of sunshine, mild temperature, and a limited amount of rainfall due to the country's geographical position. Its rugged relief and its distribution between the mainland and the sea, there is great variation of Greece's climate affected by interaction between two. Olympia, home of original Olympic Games, and these people, they were always had to hike up and down, walking around, so it became very athletic. And so the sports or athletic or walking or running, competing become so it started a con contest, which is Olympic Games, it started original Olympic Games. And Mount Olympus, home of Zeus and other Olympian gods, because of his majesty, that's where the Greeks god lived. The high peak is Mount Olympus at 9,500 feet tall and the home to the gods of Greek. Mount Olympus has 52 peaks and most worshipped mountain of the Greece. Again, every action of every of these natural forces that they couldn't understand, it was a god assigned to it. A magnificent place with numerous forests and gorges and summit of different heights, blessed with mild climate the Mount Olympus, and surrounded by Uranus, the heaven. It never rained on Mount Olympus, nor was it ever windy. Only some clouds were appearing for time to time to isolate the God's kingdom from outside wood and bless the wood with water. The favor of the deities gave the mountain an honored places in classic Greek culture and that mythical status has been passed down through the centuries across Western and many Eastern civilizations. That setting, that thought, that concept passed on 
that Greek, classical Greek views of nature, cause of natural forces, those who contr control natural forces. Pantheon, Pantheon, the mountains, highest peak, Mikotes, they said the top up, tops out at nine, over 9,500. The ancient called Mitakas, Pantheon, and believed it was the meeting place of deities. The 12 gods were believed to have lived in the alpine ravines, which Homer described as the mountain's mysterious fold. This is that famous mountain, and this is the way they are. So that's where the gods. So the Greeks gods, the Greeks, these were the gods responsible for various natural forces. They were, and the Olympian gods on Mount Olympus presided over very facets, every every facet of ancient life, and were often grouped according to their common function. This is what they saw, they interpreted, and they devised the cause and responsible for these forces and passed it on to the Western and Eastern civilization. As I said, they were a step in the stone. We are taking you back to the first step where you stand in top of the staircase. These are you all heard it. Aphrodite, god of love and beauty, Apollo, the god of prophecy, music, and so on, and Athena, Themis, Athena, Hermes. See, these are the gods. Poseidon, which was god of the ocean, Zeus, which is the head of all the gods, and had hierarchy. Zeus was the top god. And then big forces of the earth, like oceans, Athena, earthquakes, each have another god which is appointed by Zeus. Zeus, king of all the gods. Look at the figure of that Zeus, the shape of that Zeus. That god, shape, character, looks passed on up to the present time to all the Western and Eastern culture. Poseidon, another powerful force because controlled the ocean. Remember, next to the water, that's another powerful force that was there. This Zeus had God, had all the power, decided about every forces, Everything happened. That was his command, was passed on to the others. And, and these are Greek gods, of course. They are patterned by all ancient civilization. These were Greeks, Zeus, Jupiter was in Rome. For example, if you come to the Persian, it's Zoster. All this ancient civilization patterned this and characterized the same thing as Zeus. And as you see the list, these are ancient civilizations. They had the same character, same philosophy, the same power. Pantheon, and they built temples to these gods. The temple of Nephantis in Athens is the best preserved of all ancient Greek temples. Exactly, this temple built into the goddess and gods Again, also passed to all the civilization, mosque and church or synagogue. Greek mythology, for the most part, with some modification, was followed by all ancient civilization. The most creative were the Mesopotamian, which is where the Middle East, like now Syria, Iran, just like that. But all these civilization, all of them five, had gods and goddesses. When they created, they tried to compete or with the previous, another civilization, gods and goddesses. 
Jerusalem, for example, that's been getting close to the holy sites of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. This was where the holy books of these three dominant present religions was written. This, all the writers were this city, Jerusalem. You see at the horizon, this is Mosque of Omar. This is where Muhammad went up to see the God to get the message firsthand. This is Western walls, excuse me, the Jewish holy place. And this is Church of Ascension, where Jesus was lifted going up. A mosque of Omar, as I said, where Muhammad went to see the God, get the message, and the Western Wall, which is the Jewish. So this is a holy city where Mesopotamian generated, developed their gods and their characteristics. And if you know this, just a second. The roots of Judaism date back to around 2000 BC when Abraham refused to worship the idols which were common during that period. He's considered by Jews to be the first to believe in a single God. For the first time, this civilization, Romans have Poseidon, Tuas, Titan, and so on, a single God. Judaism is more organized form has begun with Moses who is believed to have received the Ten Commandments from God in Mount Sinai after the Israelite exodus from Egypt around 1500 BC. In the Bible, Abraham was called the first Hebrew. Judaism, believing only in one God, tracing his beginning back to Abraham when nearly 2,000 years ago, when the, he got, the God chose Abraham to be his special servant. And these Mesopotamian, which is now going to current, their descriptions is written in Torah, that's the Old Testament, Bible, the New Testament. But remember, Bible has, has the Old Testament news, and by the Muslim, Quran, which has all those plus some segment that Muhammad add to it, the prophet. So these are the people who wrote these books in that area, in Jerusalem. And past the dawn, we still, many people in the woods follow that. So this is Abraham, the father of three faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Again, the same ideas of Greece, that this God required obedience obedience. Whatever we tell you, follow it. For example, here they give you the example, which is they created the first Jewish people. God asked Abraham to go and sacrifice his only son. Characterize that God. Then, during the 15th century, Pope Julius II asked Michelangelo to paint the entire history of the Old Testament, New Testament, all on the Sistine Chapel, exactly as it is described in the books. The most major, of course, Michelangelo, as you know, was a sculpture, made a statue. And so, and Pope every week will come to see as Michelangelo in his back the scaffolds, painting these on the wall. If you have seen it, if you see it, it's the whole story of which is Judaism, Christianity, and Islam believed in. And one of the scenes is famous, called it Fresca, which is Allah, God, Yahweh, created Adam out of his image. By the way, when Michelangelo painted, also you have read Michelangelo's description, 
he had a normal sized penis. And when the Pope came in, he said, no, no, that could excite some people coming through. So Michelangelo goes back and reduced the size. So it is a Pope which gives description. And so again, this is it. God is a male, like the same shape as Zeus. It's created a man first in his image. The same philosophy of Greece follows. And the face of God from the creation of Adam, as I saw that face. Again, the same patterns, looks of God followed from Romans, Greece, Egyptian, and Persians. Then separation of land from water. These are famous frescas, patterns on Sistine Chapel. And again, this God has a lot. Sistine Chapel, one of the fam most famous frescas, flood of Noah, to show everyone to go there to see God finally had, had enough for people and said, Noah, build the ark, your family in the ark, six, seven, and I'm going to be in the water and drown everyone, man, woman, children, animals. And so that's a, one of the most famous frisca to show, as you saw, God vengeance. Flood of Noah. And this God of Mesopotamia also had messengers, as you all know. Moses, prophet Moses, founder of Judaism, on the Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments. I participated on archaeological site, and I was going, I have climbed the Sinai. It's a beautiful geology snow, it's a lot of granite, red granite, and it's granite, but it says has these flat surfaces, faces. And um, safety like that um, is in Sinai Peninsula. Of course, then Jesus. They say God was disappointed Moses didn't carry his message, pass it on right. So choose Jesus to bring the farm. Christ was founder of Christianity, born in Bethlehem. Again, just stay like that. And then after a while, as I said, there was a competition between these areas of Mesopotamia. Muslims said, no. Muhammad was called by God to go see him in person and get the message and came back, which is Muhammad, founder of Islam. One of the things that Greeks established and cash remember, all are men. And every, every segment of this the women have a lower value. The same thing, the Greeks just followed it, the same pattern. Greeks philosophers, now, that was one of the Greeks tradition that has the religion, the dom three dominant religions of the present world. Also Greeks contribute a great deal to the Greek philosophers, truth seekers, thinkers, theorists, the philosophers of the five ancient civilizations, for the most part, established fundamentals of science and technology. We call it Renaissance and Industrial Revolution, which is still taking us. We have the day. So we give credit to them. The second, ancient Greeks, philosophers, scientists, fathers of philosophy. One of these, of course, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. This is right now, Eastern Law University follows that concept. Socrates was one of the most powerful thinkers in history. He encourages the students to examine their beliefs. Socrates asked them a series of leading questions to show that people hold many contradictory opinions. He always asked, tell me, prove it, why? This method of teaching by question and answer approach we call it critical thinking now. Approach is known as the Socratic method. He devoted his life to gaining self-knowledge and once wrote, there is only one good knowledge and one evil, which is ignorance. 
The same thing, Plato, into wealthy Athenian family. Plato had a career as a wrestler and poet before he became philosopher. He studied with Socrates after his teacher died. Plato established a school, academy. And Aristotle, son of one of the physicians, was one of the brightest students at Plato's academy. He came there as a young man and stayed for 20 years until Plato's death in 350 BC. Aristotle opened his own school in Athens called the Lyceum. This school eventually rivaled with academy. Aristotle once argued who who studies how things originated and came into being will achieve the clearest view of them. And many of these you're familiar with who establish our present principle of science, mathematics, geometry, and still with principle. So Pliny, Pythagorean concept, you still use it. Democritus. So the dichotomy, the Greeks make two most fundamental left heritage we still follow. The faith, religion, exactly we follow that pattern, and the science and technology. 15 centuries we developed so-called scientific revolution. That's everything in nature follows rule of science. And if that was the case, so-called mechanistic philosophy which they initiated, everything's pieces together must follow certain laws physics, chemistry, biology. So these ancient civilizations established staircase, which brought us to this point. We just landed a curiosity on Mars. But they started it, about fate of things in the things, the gravity and magnetics and so on like that. I answer any question you have? Thank you very much. I could share mine with you. <laughs> well, any question? You know, there are mind of shape, mind of emotions and ideas. Any question? At least we got food for thought, but we say that for uh, dinner to come. And uh, I hope you have enjoyed it. Anyone disagree with anything I said? Let's <laughs> ask it that now. See if somebody says yes or no. Who can disagree with you? <laughs> Such a wonderful <laughs> friend I have. <laughs> we fight together. I tell my students that Dr. Barlow is my dear friend, and we fight a lot about lots of things because he says things, and I tell him why, and he gives me a reason. I tell him I'm not convinced, and he asks me for a reason. I give him a reason. He's not convinced, so we fight. And <laughs> We smile. Like grandchildren and children fight, huh? <laughs> very good. Thank you Thank very much. Thank you very much for coming. Have a great evening. Alan, sir, this yeah. was so fascinating that you connected the Greek thought, philosophy, and so with, with the three major religions that we know of uh, now, the Judaism, and Christianity. I thought that was very interesting. Thank you very much. It's my colleague, Bloyat, if you have friends left. Yes, and we owe really a lot to these ancients. They were our grand grandparents. They were the one. They were, uh, uh, you know, they started it. They guide us. So Greeks, all ancient civilization did the same thing. They had two paths, and that was good. They want to prove the things they said with science and technology and both ways. So we still go following exactly the same pattern, the same argument, the same discussion. We have the same continue. They just, they were great thinkers and great philosophers. Any other questions or comments? Make one quick comment. I'll just make one quick comment. Um, just as a sort of a, a reminder, um, everything you said was absolutely true, but uh, it's important to remember that the so called philosophers, the beginning of Thales and so on, and sometimes uh, they follow. Folks are uh, in a very, very tiny minority, and the vast majority.
majority of this. In fact, here's a move along the lines of what you were describing Same. before about Poseidon being the source of the earthquake right. and the storm and so on. And that was the prevailing view among most Greeks. And this carried on probably until the Crusades. You're absolutely correct, yes. Yeah. They carried that message through, yes. And, of course, their message didn't, the message of scientists, philosophers, there's some group that took that and carry it through. They are the one, the first time they said it has to be proven and call you all heard mechanistic philosophy. It things must work together, but not forces of nature. And so mechanistic philosophy, magnetics, gravity, forces, all like that, like a machine. And we have to look at Earth exactly like a machine, a system. I, right now we have called it a spaceship Earth. Spaceship Earth, like a machine, do you have to be maintained? We are passengers on a spaceship Earth, so that mechanics and philosophy actually become more and more vivid. And thank you. We have more questions. Email him. He's welcome to email. Yeah. Thank you very much. Hey, Bahalwadi, are you with you? Thank you very much.